Bibles today, and you'd open them please to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Second Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, and we stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I read from the King James text, otherwise known as Old Faithful. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter, of such an one will I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities, infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan sent to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong." Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word for today. The word of God is exalted above all else. Jesus, as we strive to break the bread of life, we desire to hear from heaven today. God, if ever I've needed the anointing and presence and power of the Holy Ghost, I need it today. Lord, there's nothing that I can say that would help anyone or be a benefit to anyone. But Lord Jesus, by the anointing today, you're able to break the rock in pieces. You're able, God, today to loose the bands that bind. You're able, Lord, today to deliver the captive. You're able today to heal the sick can cleanse the leper and raise the dead by your very word that would go forth. Lord, anoint us this hour to declare your word boldly and plainly in love that it might be received by the hearer. Anoint the ears of the hearer to receive that which the Spirit today would speak unto the churches. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this morning. And if y'all can just bear with my squeaky voice, hopefully by tonight it will improve a little bit. If you ever notice, sometimes the greatest irritations in our lives, sometimes the cause for the greatest discomfort in our lives, in fact, can be something as small and minute as a poppy seed that's stuck between our teeth. You ever notice that? The other day I had a little something just caught up between my teeth and boy it was hurting and it was irritating and it was driving me crazy and I thought to myself isn't it amazing that something so small can be such a huge discomfort can be such a huge problem can cause such great pain but that's the way it is, not only in the natural realm, but that's the way it is as well in the spiritual realm. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he is a man with quite a history and quite an experience with God. He says, yes, 
I've had lots of visions. I've had lots of revelations from the Lord. I've experienced many things from God. He said, but I know some who've experienced even more than I have. Amen. You know, I love people who think they're so spiritual that they have nobody next to them that can compete with all that they've experienced with God. I love people who think themselves so great and mighty in the Holy Ghost that nobody can possibly begin to imagine the things that they have experienced with God. You ever met somebody like that? Amen. They can tell the stories, but the minute you start telling the story, it's like, oh, no, 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 but you don't get it. I'm way better than that. I've got, my experience goes way further than that. <clears throat> Paul acknowledged in our primary text this morning, he said, yes, I've had a lot of experience. Yes, I've had a lot of revelation. Yes, I've had a lot of visions. He said, but you know what? I can point you to some that I know that have had a lot more than I have. I thank God I know people in this life that I can look at and say, I believe they had a whole lot more than I do. You hear what I'm telling you today? Anybody that knows me knows that I idolized Brother Gillum, that he was a he was a mentor of mine, and I just adored him and thought he was wonderful. And Brother Gillum, I wished I had everything Brother Gillum had. I wished I had the experience Brother Gillum had. I wished I had the ministry Brother Gillum had. I wished I had the life that Brother Gillum had, but I don't. And that's okay, because God didn't call all of us to be exactly the same. We're not all supposed to be little clones floating around, living the same exact life and doing the same exact things. And, have, you know, that's the way some churches teach. We're all supposed to look identical. We're all supposed to act identical. We're all supposed to talk identical. We're all supposed to wear the same kind of shoes. We're all supposed to have the same kind of hairstyle. Well, that's not really how it works. Diversity is part of God's kingdom. People coming from different places and different experiences. We don't all have the same. We don't come in with the same. And we're not going to walk out with the same. That's the way life is. But I thank God there are people that I can look at and say, you know what? I've had a marvelous ministry. I've seen God do great things. But boy, I'll tell you what. I could point you to a preacher I knew, and I wish you could have seen his ministry. I wish you could have seen J.T. Gunn. I wish you could have seen Brother Davis. I wish you could have seen uh, Brother T.F. Tenney. I wish you could have seen some of these men that I hold in such high esteem and in such high regard because their ministries are, are so incredible. As many wonderful things as I've experienced in my life. I've never experienced like Brother Tenney did. I've never been invited to preach in a, in a group of Jewish theologians who wanted to know what is this belief you have in one God? What is that about? Explain it to us. And Brother Ershon couldn't go to the meeting, so he sent Brother Tenney in his place. And Brother Tenney is a marvelous man of God. And Brother Tenney went there and he preached on the oneness of God in Christ and Jesus is his name. And out of 1,200 people that heard him, 800 were baptized in Jesus' name. Jewish people. Yes, amen believed this Christian gospel because that message they could embrace. Yes, they said we couldn't embrace that other one. We couldn't quite get that. That other one is contrary to our Jewish background and our Jewish teaching. But what you're teaching is in perfect compliance with Jewish teaching. I got news for you. The true Christian gospel is in perfect compliance with Jewish teaching. Do you hear what I'm saying? The true Christian gospel is in perfect compliance with Jewish teaching. If it wasn't, the Christian church wouldn't exist today because it was founded on the back of a bunch of Jews. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Amen. The reason they could believe the gospel then is because we they preached it the way we're preaching it, not the way some of these others are preaching it in the world today. And if we were all preaching it the way we preach it, there'd be a lot more Jews in the church today. Amen. And the reason during the tribulation that there's going to be a whole lot more Jewish people coming into the church is because by the tribulation, there's going to be a lot more of us than there are of them. That's right. Amen. 
Because a lot of people are going to realize the error of their ways. And they're going to say, you know what? We've been standing around like a bunch of dummies preaching a doctrine that was originated in Rome. Yes, amen. Didn't have anything to do with God's truth. Didn't have anything to do with God. But it originated in the heart of the early Roman Catholic Church. And we've been preaching this doctrine. And we've been, we've been defending this doctrine. And all of a sudden we're going to realize that was an error. Yes, amen. And they're going to start preaching the truth about Jesus Christ. Amen. The truth about Jesus Christ is he was God. Yes, amen. amen. Not God the Son. Amen. You'll never read that phrase one place in scripture. Right. Not one time will you read the phrase God the Son. Not one time. Not one time. But you will read. And Isaiah 9 and 6, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The same one we call the Prince of Peace is the same one that's called the Everlasting Father. The same one we call the Prince of Peace, the same one we call Counselor, we also call the Almighty God. And unless you want to make the same error as the Jehovah's Witnesses and try to separate and try to, uh, to say, well, he's the almighty God, but the Father is the mighty God. Then you fall into the same error yes. as some organizations that have long ago fallen into heresy. And my friend, you need to be careful. Now I told you this morning, you come into this church, you better expect truth because that's what I'm going to hand you. Amen. I don't mince words with it. I don't play with it. Because this is what the Word of God teaches and we're going to preach it that way. And that's the way it's going to be. Amen. I want you to know sometimes the most troublesome things in our lives are little things. They don't have to be big things. But they sure can cause us big trouble. Sometimes little tiny things can cause us the biggest amount of grief. And the best way to deal with it is this stuff right here. Dental floss. Here you go. Pass that back for me. See that little string? That little string can bring you relief, can it? <laughs> that little string can sure help you to feel better when something's troubling you. That little bitty piece of string can sure help you to walk out of the restroom feeling a lot more comfortable and a lot better than when you went into it. Amen. I want you to know today, my friend, that God has given us our faith and it is our obedience to that faith that serves today as the devil force that is able to wipe every demon out of your soul that would try to trouble you. Every spirit that would come against your mind. Every demonic presence that would try to come against you and tell you that you have no place with God. That you have no right to approach God. That you do not have the ability to come before the presence of God. I'm telling you tonight. When the devil comes against your mind without the floss, hallelujah, it's a little bitty problem trying to cause you a big annoyance, hallelujah. And all we need to do is walk in faith and obedience and we can floss that devil right out of our teeth, amen. They used to sing an old song, I'm going to wash that gray right out of my hair. Well, we'll make a new one. I'm going to floss that devil right out of my teeth, okay. You can floss that demonic power right out, uh, uh, right out of your teeth, right out of aggravating you and causing you discomfort and pain. The Apostle Paul said, lest I should be exalted in a measure through the abundance of the revelations. He said, folks, I've had great experience with God. God's revealed many things to me. But at the same time, just to prevent that abundance of knowledge and revelation from causing me to become puffed up and bigger in my mind than I ought to be. He said, there was given to me. He didn't say this thing came and attacked him. He said it was given to me. A thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Has God ever placed something in your life that's caused you a lot of frustration and aggravation and sometimes you wished it wasn't there? 
But you know what? It may be demonic. It may be that the devil tries to torment you over it. But the truth of the matter is, God's put it there. You hear me today? It's a gift from God. Amen. So, oh, Brother Ma, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. It's the gift of God. Yes. It's there by design to keep you humble. It's there by design to help you remember your need for God's grace. It's there by design to help you never to lean upon your own right arm, but always to lean upon Him. It's there to remind you that you can't do it, but He can. It's there as a reminder that you are nothing. But he is everything. Amen. Oh, friend, I'll tell you, if people would only realize in our community that there are things in our lives that we have no control over. But you know what? It's a gift from God. God has put it there on purpose. It serves his purpose. It serves his function. It's doing his will. And if you'll just let it and learn to live with it, you know what? You'll have a more wonderful, peaceful life than you've ever had in your entire existence. Amen. Say, what? I've got to make peace with the devil? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you've got to learn to live with the enemy. Amen. You hear me today? Oh, Brother Ma, that's not in keeping with, with victory theology. Now, you're, you're, not, you're not preaching like some of these other preachers do. That God will deliver us from everything that the devil ever throws at us. Well, that's funny. Of course I'm not preaching that. Because Paul didn't preach that. Paul said, I asked the Lord three times to deliver me from this. And God's answer to me was, my grace is sufficient. Brother, these preachers that run around saying God will deliver you from everything and anything, these are the same nit nit wits that are telling gay lesbian people that they need to change and be straight. These are the same nit wits that are telling people that they can't be who they are and that issues in their lives ought not to be. It's telling people who have addiction uh, issues and addictive personalities that they shouldn't have that because after all, that's a weakness and that's something that shouldn't be part of the life of a child of God. And God forbid that a child of God needs support to stay sober or to stay clean. Oh my Lord, have mercy. I talked to somebody in our, that wants to come to our church this week. And I talked to her and I told her, I said, in the future, our ministry is going to have support fellowships. We don't call them support groups. We call them support fellowships. And we're going to have support fellowships for people with drug and alcohol addiction issues. If you're trying to live clean and sober, we're going to support you in that. And we're going to try to help you with that. And we're going to do everything in our power to give you all the encouragement and all the faith and all the inspiration that you can handle to keep you sober and to keep you free of drugs. And she said, praise God. So many churches, they act like, well, but if you're a child of God, this should never be an issue for you. If, this, if you're a child of God, you should never have a problem with this. Well, I'd like to know where these people got their salvation, because Paul sure might like to have gotten it. <laughs> he sure didn't get the same salvation they got. Because God didn't deliver Paul from every trouble that troubled him. God didn't deliver Paul from every demon that tormented him. God didn't deliver Paul from every weakness that he struggled with. So I'd like to know where these nincompoops got their salvation. Because obviously they got it somewhere that we don't know about. Because Paul didn't get it. But you see, my friend, we've got to learn to understand that sometimes these, these annoyances and these difficulties are God-given. It's a gift. It's there to serve His purpose and His function. It's doing us a favor. Amen. You hear me? It's doing us a favor. It's keeping us humble. It's keeping us mindful of our need for the grace of God. I don't know about you, but being who I am helps me every day remember that. Yes, amen. amen. Just waking up in the morning, I'm, I'm immediately reminded that I need the grace of God. Yes, 
can't say why, Brother Ma, because you believe that who you are is a, a big sinner. And that, no, that's not what I said. But you know what? As long as there's people in this world that think that who I am makes me the biggest sinner in the world, you hear me today. You see, the devil doesn't always torment you with truth. Oh, that's right. Amen. You hear me today? The Bible said that he's a liar and the father of lies. I didn't say the devil always torments you with truth. A lot of times he torments you with the biggest falsehood and the biggest lie that ever was uh, uh, ever was made. That was ever perpetrated on humanity. But that's part of the process. That's part of the reality that we face every day. We have to deal with these lies. We have to deal with these falsehoods. We have to deal with these untruths. But true or false, it reminds me regardless of my need for God. And I look and say, when somebody comes to me and say, well, don't you know, blah, 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 and they're telling a bunch of fibs and lies, I'm able to turn to them and say, but don't you know, God's grace is sufficient for me, hallelujah. Don't you know that God's grace is able to keep me? Don't you know if I believe this thing and embrace this thing and walk in this thing that God will not fail me? Amen. Glory to God. I want you to know today, listen to what the word of the Lord tells us. Philippians 4.13, something we're all familiar with. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I can do, I can do, I can do, not Christ can do. That verse doesn't say, Christ can do all things through me. It says, I can do all things through Christ. That means it is not the tasks that the Lord needs done that we're promised strength for. But it's the tasks that we need to do that the Word of God tells us we'll have strength for. Too many preachers twist this verse out of context and make it say something that it does not. It is not what God needs done that He's promised us the strength for. It's what we need done. I can do all things through Christ. I can stay sober. I can stay drug free. I can stay clean. I can stay victory living. I can do what I need to do. I can do it. Hallelujah. Because Christ gives me the strength to do it. Glory to God. You know, I hear preachers, they have people stepping up to things they should have never stepped up to to begin with because not anything needs to be done, not anything they need to be doing. The Bible said, I can do all things through Christ. So you just go lay hands on that Cadillac and it's yours. <laughs> you big donkey, go lay hands on that Cadillac and see if next month you aren't driving the same old Volkswagen you're driving today. But that preacher's going to be driving the Cadillac because he got your money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If there's something that comes my way, this is why I don't believe like the snake handle on churches do. You know, they <clears throat> take quite literally in Mark, the scripture said they'll take up serpents and if they drink and they do the things that bless God, they bring them into the church. Woo-hoo! Slim those snakes around. <sighs> no, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But you know what? I don't need to be doing that. That's stupid. There's absolutely no need for me to be dragging snakes into the church. That isn't proven nothing to nobody but me. And I already know I'm a child of God, so I don't need to hold a snake to prove it. You hear what I'm telling you today? I'm going to tell you, if I'm like this one preacher, I remember a Church of God preacher years ago. And he talked about he was driving to a meeting. He was an evangelist, and he was driving to a meeting. I believe it was in California. He was going through the desert. He saw all of a sudden the tire blew on his car, and he, the car kind of pushed its way over to the side of the road, and he got out of the car, and his wife's in the car. He said, I went back to where the tire, 
that I needed to change was, he said, and there within six inches of that tire is the biggest, ugliest rattlesnake I ever saw. He said, now here we are. We got to get to that meeting. We don't have a lot of time to kill. We don't have a lot of time to waste. He said, so I just said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. He said, I reached out and grabbed that old thing and just lifted it over my head and threw it out into the desert and changed my tire and went on my way. Now that I believe in. If you need to do it, the strength is there to do it. But if there's no need, then don't try. Hello now. If there's a need to do it, God will give you the ability to do it. But if there's not a need, then friend, you're just making a fool out of yourself. I remember a man years ago in the assemblies of God that I grew up in who got converted and he was a neighbor of ours. <laughs> And he had a lot of zeal and no wisdom. You've heard the old saying, zeal without wisdom, right? Well, I mean, he was zippo, zilcho, nada. This man had no wisdom, bless his heart. He just had all kind of faith and all kinds of zeal. And one day he decided he's going to take his jacket off down at the local state park. And he was going to slap that jacket of his down in the middle of the book and make it part like the prophet did in the Old Testament. Bless God, just going to take my jacket and slap. And the water's going to part because I believe it will. The Bible said if I believe it enough, it'll happen. There's only one principle, Mr. Canfield, that you forgot. And that is that uh, if there's no need, yeah, that's right. <laughs> then there's no power. Yeah. You're hearing me today. If there's no need, there's no power. If the need were there for you to do that, God would do it for you. But there was no need, so you're just standing there making a fool out of yourself. We got a lot of people running around in the world trying to make magic happen and using the name of Jesus like a magic talisman. That's not how it works. You know why miracles were more common 100 years ago and 200 years ago and 300 years ago than they are today in the Pentecostal church? Because 300 years ago, Pentecostal church wasn't here. But you know why miracles were more common back then than they are today? It's very easy. It's very simple. Because the need then was greater. We were able to do less and less for ourselves back then. People had to turn to God or else they'd die. They didn't have the medical treatments. They didn't have the hospitals. They didn't have the doctors. They didn't have the technology. So therefore the need was greater. And I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And where the need was, the power was. One of the problems we have in our world today is we've come into the layer of the sea and age where people say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. I don't need God. The doctors are doing a grand job. I don't need God. You know, my investor, uh, my investment portfolio is doing real good. I don't need God because I've got a good job. I've got this. I've got all the money I need. I've got... You see, brother, the less need there is, the less you see the power of God. But you see, the reality is that where there's need, God's power can manifest itself. You know why I'm kind of glad that our church isn't just busting out the seams this morning? You know why? Because that means we need God's help. That means we've got to rely upon God. That means we have to lean on the Lord to get this thing done. That means we can't possibly do it on our own and then just give credit to God. No, when God gets the credit, he's going to get the glory because he did the job. Hallelujah. When it really comes to pass and this thing really happens, it's really going to have been God. And I like that. So that's okay, Lord. Sometimes it's not a bad thing to be on the needy end of need. You understand what I'm telling you today? Sometimes it's not a bad thing to be on the needy end of need. Because when you're on the needy end of need, you're on the strong side of God. 
and you're on the side where things can happen. You're on the side where miracles take place. You're on the side where provision comes. Remember old Elijah? He took up residence by the brook Kidron, you remember? An old man was hungry, and here come the ravens bringing him food. Why? Because there was a need. He didn't go over there and have a picnic, and God sent him food just to send him food. Yes, amen. That's right. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? There was a need there. I remember missionaries that were in, if I'm not mistaken, they were off in some Russian-Ukrainian territory somewhere way out in the, you know, in parts of that country, it's very snowy and very cold, and they were stuck, and they had gotten trapped out there somewhere, several people, and they said all of a sudden, they looked up, and in the distance they saw this big, humongous white beast on four legs walking in their direction, it was a polar bear, and the bear had a bag in its mouth. And the polar bear came into their camp and dropped the bag and turned around and left, and it was food. Well, the next day, that stupid bear came back and did it again. Huh. And that bear did it until they were found. When they were finally found, the people said, you don't believe this. So, is, is there a camp somewhere near us? Is there, is there something like close at hand uh, that, you know, maybe this bear that we kept seeing stole? And, and, the, and they said, what bear? They said, the polar bear, the big white polar bear, you know, polar bears. <laughs> and they said, polar bears are not indigenous to this part of the world. We don't have polar bears here. Oh, but children, they had polar angels. Hallelujah. And angels are always clad in white. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, where there's need, God is strong. Where there's need, God is able. Where there's weakness, God is able. Oh, children, don't you let that little seed in your teeth bother you. Sometimes that's the very thing you need for God to be on the giving end, for God to be on the strong end, for God to be on the powerful end, the provisionary end. Hallelujah. Lord, I get so tired of being broke. I lost my income. Uh, I'll tell you more plainly. I was on disability, and I figured out, well, I hate disability. Can't stand it. But I said, you know what? My pa my pastor, my uh, doctor told me years ago, I went through a hospitalization and nearly died. This six years ago in October. And uh, my doctor told me, he said, after everything I've been through and everything, he said, you don't need to be trying to work and pastor. He said, pastoring's hard enough. He knew. He said, pastoring's hard enough. He said, you work on your church and let disability support you so you don't have to worry about your finances. Just, you know. And like a dummy, I agreed to it. Wished I'd have never done it. Because it turned out to be a trap, in a sense. Well, <clears throat> I got on disability. Get here to Texas. Long and short of it, Mr. Bush has decided to create some new rules and regulations. He's trying to do everything in his power to boot people off of disability that he can. But see, what he doesn't take into account is that all these people he's booting off of disability, you can't just very easily slip over into a profession that will provide you with all the income and benefits and whatever that you need to compensate for, for the benefits that you have while you're on disability. So it really creates a huge vacuum and it causes an, an enormous problem. In January, I was booted off of disability. And I've appealed to a U.S. Senator to try to get it reestablished. I said, Lord, just till my church can support me full time. That's all I want. I don't want it forever. I just want it till the church can support me full time. But it's been nine, nearly nine months, and I've had no income. None. I can't contribute to the church because I don't have anything. I used to be able to. Uh, I can't pay my own rent. I mean, a lot of difficulty. But you know, I've learned a long time ago that where there's no need, <laughs> God can't do much. Amen, you hear me? If 
there's no need, then God can't do a whole lot. So sometimes you're better off on the needy end. Because it's only when I've been in this place that I'm at right now that I've been able to see God do great things. That I've seen God provide in ways that I couldn't even have imagined. I've seen miracles come. Had an old van that I tried to sell for a couple of months. Had signs on it and all this. Couldn't sell that thing for love and money. Couldn't, couldn't get anybody even call on it. An old Dodge minivan. Couldn't get anybody even look at it. Not one call in the entire time. Then all of a sudden I'm driving down the road, the van dies. I had to push it out of the road. Oh, I was five steps from cussing, let me tell you. I was just... Mm. <laughs> had to push that bugger out of the road, push it out of the road, push it into a parking lot of a, a little strip mall. Now I'm trying to figure out how in God's green earth am I going to get that dumb van running again? How am I going to be able to afford to get that van running again? Yeah. What happens? Somebody sees the number on the sign on the van, because I had the church signs on it, calls me up and says, I'd like to make you an offer on that van. I said, are you aware that it's broke down? It's not running? Yeah, that's okay. Excuse me, the dumb thing was running fine just a month ago. I was trying to sell it a month ago, and nobody would even call me on it. Now it's sitting there dead, and you want to buy it? Yes, yeah. Well, you know what? The time was just right. Because I needed to pay some things. I needed to get some bills paid. I needed, including part of the rent here at the church. And you know what? When I sold that van, it just whoosh, took care of one whole month's worth of, worth of our needs. Amen? Amen? So you see, God knows what he's doing. Where there's need, God can move. If the, I can't make this a point enough. I want you to understand. If you have everything, then honey, you don't need nothing. If you don't need nothing, then you don't need God. What need have you for God? Paul said, no, I had a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. I had a poppy seed up in my, <laughs> in my tooth. And oh man, it was driving me nuts. But you know what? It reminded me of my need for God. It helped me to remember that in every circumstance, in every situation, I always need God. Because if everything was going perfect, Tommy, and if everything was going grand and you had all the money you needed and you had all the everything you need, you know what? You'd forget God so fast you had to turn around. That's right. Yes, amen. Do you hear me? Right. Do not the Laodicean church say, I'm rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. All of a sudden, boy, God was off in the distance. They forgot all about him. Uh -huh. Forgot all about him. I don't need nothing. I don't need God. I don't need nothing. I don't need church. Why do I need church? I'll tell you, some of the best church folks you're ever going to have are poor folks. Oh, yes. Amen. Right. Amen. Yeah, you give them wealthy... Christian folks that some of these preachers and teachers run around telling you about and they'll be out on their boat on Sunday morning. Yeah, they'll be out at their vacation house on the weekends. But you know what? You take them poor folks that live every day with a little bit of need in their life and they're more than happy to come to the house of God. They're more than happy to come into the church house. They're more than happy to get down on their knees and seek the face of God and say, Lord, I need I need you. I need your help. I need your strength. I love members that are folks who've lived with addiction issues. I love folks who've lived with alcoholism and drug addiction. You know why? Because they know what it is to need. Because they've got that little thing stuck up in their tooth that irritates them just enough to remind them that they need God. Young lady I met this week, what did she say? She said, she said, I am in recovery. She said, and, and I know I need church. I know I need to have a home church. I know I need to have a church family. See, Mom, sometimes having that annoyance, sometimes having that devil just up in there, sometimes that's just what you need to remind you of your need for God. You understand what I'm saying today? Romans chapter 8 verses 31 through 39. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things?
Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? I could sum all that up in one word. Need. <laughs> so any form of need separate us from the love of God. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor height, nor, uh, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, mother, a little bit of me never hurt anybody. A little reminder that we're human never hurt anybody. A little demon that wants to torment you with a falsehood or a truth. It doesn't matter either way. The reality, he ain't going to hurt you. He's no more trouble to you than something you can solve with a piece of floss. You hear me today? And that floss is faith and obedience. That's all it is. A little bit of faith and obedience and you'll wipe him right out. He'll be out of your teeth. Don't worry, he'll be back. <coughs> Have you ever noticed? <coughs> Have you ever noticed? Whenever you clean something out of your teeth with floss, before too long you got to go back and do it again. Because something will always find its way right back there, won't it? Amen. In Isaiah 54, 17, the word of God promises us, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me and their righteousness is of me and their righteousness is of me do you get that this morning saints your righteousness isn't about you it's about him your righteousness doesn't depend on you it depends on him and their righteousness is of me saith the lord hallelujah isaiah 59 19 so shall they fear the name of the lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And those who've been in our church very long know you've heard me teach on this before. The reality is what God is saying here is not simply that he'll raise a barrier between us and the enemy. That's right, amen. You can get between barriers. He said, when the enemy comes in like a flood, that he will lift up a standard. And you know what that literally means? Go back into the original text and look real careful. It means he'll lift the ground beneath my feet so that I'm on high ground. Hallelujah. So that I'm always above the water level. No matter how high the water level gets, the ground I'm standing on will always be higher. Because when the enemy comes in against me like a flood, God said, I will lift up a standard against him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Sometimes you feel the enemy coming against you and there's great need. And you say, oh Lord, I need. And God says, I know what you need. And just about then you feel the earth begin to shake. And you feel things begin to rattle. And all of a sudden the ground you're standing on begins to rise high up toward the sky. And the water is well beneath you where it cannot harm you. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Woo! That's exciting, isn't it? Amen. Glory to God. I like that. We've had Hurricane Katrina come through. I bet there's a lot of people wished the ground they were on just rose and kept them above the fray, don't you? Above the flood. Zechariah 4 and 6, the word of the Lord said, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. 
God to murder when we need strength? God don't have to give us strength. What he has to give us is his spirit. Because when he gives us his spirit, the strength is the byproduct of the presence of his spirit. Do you hear what I'm saying? When we need faith, guess what? God don't have to give us faith. All he has to do is send his spirit. Because his spirit comes and the byproduct of the presence of the Holy Ghost is faith. Hallelujah. You ever been in a place where you didn't know where to go and where to turn and what to do? And you went and you found yourself in the presence of God and all of a sudden you had faith. You didn't know where it came from. You had zeal. You didn't know where it came from. You had enthusiasm. You didn't know where it came from. You had inspiration. You didn't know where it came from. All because you were in the presence of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. Woo! That's the byproduct of being in the presence of God's Spirit. Say, Brother Mark, you told us. He said, He'll give us, the, the Lord gives us strength to do what we need to do for ourselves. But is there anything in the Word of God where God helps us with the work He asks us to do? Oh, yes. The promise to those who are doing the Lord's work is found in Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Listen. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. Listen to me now. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Oh, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary.